steel. Steel represents a $36 billion a year industry that employs thousands of people. Steel enters every facet of modern life. It is the backbone of American productivity. beset with problems of higher manufacturing costs and increased governmental regulation, U.S. steelmakers now face a crisis caused by the appearance on the market of low-priced foreign-produced steel. Because they are backed by their governments, foreign steel manufacturers now control a competitive edge in the marketplace. In fact, 44% of the world's steel is produced by government-owned companies. The problem that the American steel industry faces is one of high production cost versus low market prices. One possible solution is that the American government offer to the U.S. manufacturers the same kind of support their foreign counterparts receive. However, we believe there is a better solution. steel industry was born in America and we believe the answer is found in what made this industry strong in the first place individuals working in a free enterprise system the United States need not fall behind foreign competition the steel industry can only pull itself out of its present crisis through a process of efficiency and productivity afforded by free enterprise this is the story of a major steel company, the Armco Steel Corporation of Middletown, Ohio, and how it increased its productivity and gained a firmer foothold in the competitive market. Armco has always been an innovator. They were the first in the industry to establish their own research facilities. They were the first to institute a safety program for their people and the first to start an eight-hour workday. But we're talking about technology. Armco was among the leaders in electric furnaces, BOF plants, and coal injection systems. They were the first to make coils of steel. The Armco plant at Ashland, Kentucky is considered a showplace of modern steel-making technology. The Ashland plant has been recognized as the cleanest steel mill in the nation and has received awards from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Recently, Armco's Belfont and Amanda blast furnaces were modified to increase production capacity. These renovations meant that the capacity of the existing ore handling system was inadequate. They would have to build another. The previous system used a side dump car and engine shuttling between the railroad car dumper and the ore yard. The car could handle 100 tons per trip. A round trip averaged six minutes. An ore bridge would then recast the material into a storage pile. Later, the bridge would reclaim the material for distribution to the furnaces. Now that Armco planned higher production levels, the existing system could not handle the required pellet tonnage. There were several possible alternatives, including construction of an additional ore bridge. But this would not allow an important feature, the screening of pellets. A 
Another alternative was the installation of a conveyor belt to carry ore continuously from the car dumping station to the ore yard. Conveyor systems are considered to be more reliable and can handle material at greater capacity than other methods. Armco engineers called in the Fairfield Engineering Company of Marion, Ohio because of its past experience in design and fabrication of material handling systems for utility, glass, rubber, foundry, and steel companies. Fairfield developed several alternative methods based on the ideas and needs of the customer, then proceeded to determine the economic justification of each method. Beginning with the best engineering talent of both companies, the concepts were then refined by use of sketches, detailed drawings, meetings, reviews, and by using the latest computer technology. One of the design problems was to integrate the lower speed existing equipment with a high speed, high tonnage conveying system. It was of crucial importance to both Armco and Fairfield engineers that the design protect personnel and the plant against all possible anticipated emergencies. Additionally, the renovation of the ore handling equipment could not interfere with production. Another problem was the location of the new equipment. Some buildings could have been built out in the open, but this would have used up valuable space in the ore yard. With the railroad on one side and a hill on the other, the best place for the transfer station was right next to an existing electrical tower. But the most severe problem to overcome was that of time. And the solution to that problem was to overlap the phases of design, engineering, purchasing, fabrication, and erection. In this way, the time schedule could be compressed. This kind of production only works when both companies are willing to work together beyond the normal limits of cooperation. When changes are needed, understandings can be reached on the spot. With such close cooperation, all details are easily drawn together to complete a system capable of doing the job it was designed to do. This free enterprise working relationship allows the flexibility necessary to get the job done in the shortest possible time and within the budget. Beginning with a basic flow diagram, the system was planned to make the most efficient use of the existing ore bridge allowing it to do a better job and at a higher rate than had been possible with the transfer car system. But what happened to improve the economic evaluation of the entire system was the development of the screening station. Modern steel plants, such as the one at Ashland, use ore that has been pelletized. This offers several advantages, such as uniform chemical composition and ease of handling. However, smaller particles often are found mixed in with the pellets. These smaller particles of material, called fines, block the hot gases from passing evenly through the furnace, which causes channeling in the burden. The result is less efficient production and less uniformity in the product. Steelmakers know that when 80% of the burden material fed to the furnace is one-eighth of an inch or larger, the yields increase dramatically. By screening the pellets to remove the fines, productivity is increased. The furnace produces more, uses less fuel, wind rates are higher, and the life of the furnace is extended. All told, there were over 4,000 man hours spent in conceptual development and project scheduling, incorporating the project management plan, which provided the close coordination required from completion of concept to startup of the system. From this development came the design. And the drawings. The general arrangement drawings. The electrical drawings. The structural and detailed drawings.
altogether over 800 mechanical and 1,200 electrical drawings. While the design was ongoing, as drawings were completed, mechanical and electrical fabrication was started. As equipment arrived on the job site, Armco Engineering directed the construction with assistance from the Fairfield Erection Coordinator. The foundations for the various pieces of equipment and buildings were installed one year and the equipment was put in the next. Installation was done during periods or was not being received by the plant. To demonstrate the results of this joint effort, we want to show you the parts of the system beginning at the rail car unloading area and tracing the flow of material through the system. The existing unloader empties a 100-ton rail car every two minutes. This surge bin holds 815 tons, or material from eight rail cars. Beneath this bin, feeders transfer material to this first conveyor which moves it at a designated rate of 2,000 tons per hour. The conveyor carries material to the transfer house, where it can be routed in one of three directions. It can pass directly to the screening station, it can be diverted into short-term storage bins within the transfer house, or it can pass directly onto the south or yard belt. The south yard belt is 1,670 feet long. It's designed to reduce spillage and engineered for ease of maintenance. The belt, under normal conditions, should move one billion tons of material before replacement is necessary. The material passes under the reload hopper and onto the stock-out tripper, where it's tripped off the belt into the yard. Although the tripper can be operated by an operator on board and by remote control from the ore bridge, you're watching it trip material into the yard automatically. It will continue to discharge material until the proper level is detected by this sensing probe. When the level of material reaches the probe, the tripper automatically advances. It can advance in this manner for the entire length of the yard. Once the material is in the yard, the ore bridge recasts it 
building the storage pile. Material is stored in the yard until needed for blast furnace production. The ore bridge operator reclaims it from the pile, reverses the conveyor, and discharges the material into the reload hopper. The reload hopper is also designed to traverse the length of the system. The conveyor returns the material to the transfer house, where it's routed to the screening station conveyor. Once up the inclined conveyor to the screening station, the material discharges into the surge bin. Here, the load is split to two of the three available screens. There are three feeders and three screens in the station. Two are in continuous operation, and one is available on standby. The screens are built to be pulled into the center of the screening station to allow better accessibility for maintenance. Fines smaller than an eighth inch are sent to the fines conveyor leading to the center plant storage bins where they're reprocessed into center. The screen material is routed to the high line belt. At the same level, two apron feeding conveyors from the center building refeed center onto the high line conveyor. The high line conveyor had to be integrated into the center feed system so that either center or screened pellets could be properly distributed to the blast furnaces. The high line conveyor moves material to the Belfont tripper. If the material is to be sent to the Belfont furnace, it is tripped into the proper storage bin. This first tripper has a three-way flow path. Normally, the material goes down the north and south chutes into the bin underneath. It can also be routed to an outboard chute. If the material is meant for the Amanda furnace, it is put back on the high line conveyor and is transported to the Amanda tripper. The Amanda tripper will route the material to both sides of the high line belt or to an outboard chute. Both machines are equipped to automatically advance. Now that you've seen the parts of the system, we'd like to show you how they work together to produce a storing and reclaiming system of great versatility. There are four major areas of control. The High Line Control Center, the Car Dumping Station, the ore bridge, and the screening station. The high line control operator has the master control. He establishes the flow paths through the entire system. On this four foot by 26 foot control panel, every major piece of equipment is outlined and indicator lamps show every function. The operator can communicate with the other three ore handling areas and also with the blast furnace operations. Television monitors provide the operator with visual inspection of the high line bins of the Amanda and Belfont trippers. 
Although it's possible to control all functions from the Highline Control Center, some functions are delegated to other areas. The operator controlling the ore bridge operates the tripper on the stock outside as well as the reload hopper by radio control signals transmitted through the electrical system. All equipment is interlocked for safety and to prevent malfunction. Because of its remote location, the car dumper is operated separately by this man to maintain on-the-spot supervision. He communicates with the Highline operator, ore bridge operator, and railroad personnel. The equipment in the transfer house is controlled by the Highline operator. The screening station may be controlled by the Highline operator and is automatic. It can run itself. A screening station operator is available but the majority of his duties are related to the center plant. In case of malfunction, the operators will be notified by an alarm and a light on the screening station and highline control panels. The heart of the Fairfield electrical control system is found in the programmable controller. It is this equipment that allows the operator to close one switch and instantly control over 400 others. The programmable controller provides supervision over 4,300 switch contacts. This equipment is rugged and is right at home in Armco's steel plant. Each circuit board is coated with special epoxy resins to protect the circuitry for long life and low maintenance costs. All wires in the system, in the field, and in the control panels have been identified with a printed number, which is then heat sealed in plastic shrink tubing. The labels can't fall off the wires, and they will last the lifetime of the wiring. The panels are wired and tested before they leave the Fairfield plant. Panels are hooked up to simulators that interface with the panel, the same way they interface with equipment in the field. The controllers can easily be programmed using this console. Once the change is on cassette tape, it can be fed into the master program memory. Entire program changes can be fed into the memory in less than 15 minutes. The controller has been programmed for safety throughout the entire operation. For example, in case of malfunction, all of the equipment in the malfunctioning area as well as the preceding machinery is shut off. Troubleshooting anywhere in the system is facilitated by the use of a cathode ray tube display. Engineers can call up any data within the controller's memory. This display shows a matrix of all contacts and indicates the position of all switches on a particular control circuit. It is the programmable controller that gives the Fairfield system its extreme flexibility, reliability, and safety. In addition, because the controller operates on low voltages, signals can be transmitted on narrow gauge wire. And in this case, all the signals can be combined by this multiplexing unit. The operating signals between the Highline control house and the motor control house are transmitted on two wires. To have provided conventional hard wiring for the control logic for all of the switches, starter motors, safety equipment, and control lights would have been very expensive. Any future changes would also require changes in wiring and conduit. Another feature of the electrical system is the festoon cable arrangement for powering the trippers. It is well balanced and follows the travel of the equipment. It provides long-lasting, reliable power service at low maintenance costs. Here are some of the major routes and flow paths used at the Armco plant. 
rail car unloader to the ore yard or to the screening station. From screening station to furnaces. Fines are fed to the center plant and center fed to the furnaces through the high line conveyor system. From ore yard through transfer house through screening station to furnaces. Additional flexibility was allowed by using the storage bin in the transfer house. It is filled by material from rail cars while material from the yard is going through the screening station to the furnaces. Both the transfer house and the screening station can be bypassed. There are over 27 paths that are programmed into the system and they can be changed to suit operating conditions or to allow for future expansion, such as barge unloading equipment, truck dumping stations, and bucket wheel stacker reclaimer equipment. In addition, the programmable controller can be enlarged, as well as be wired to interface with computers. This system was built on an extremely tight time schedule, which it, and it was accomplished without causing any downtime, which is very important in a system involving blast furnaces. It was a job done in 20 months, and it was done by two companies operating in the free enterprise system. In no other way could a project of this magnitude have been completed in this short time span. This furnace is producing more steel, thanks to improved materials handling. With less waste, thanks to screening the fines. With improved flexibility, accommodating more present variables and future unknown ones, thanks to the new electronic capabilities of the programmable controller. With greater worker safety, thanks to a myriad of newly possible monitoring and fail-safe systems built in using less energy to get the same quantity of output in an age of growing energy scarcity and public concern about it. Thanks to the joint achievements of two companies, Fairfield Engineering and Armco Steel. This is the kind of leap in productivity with side benefits in every direction that has characterized the free enterprise system since its beginning and still does today.